Welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian. I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here on the west coast of Canada. I hope that everybody has had a great week and I hope that you're looking forward to a fantastic uh, weekend, Saturday, Sunday. I hope you find some time to relax. Enjoy the company of your loved ones and life in general. Uh, welcome, Emre. Uh, welcome to our members. Hi, Ten. Hi, Ashish. Uh, good to see our subscribers. Everyone, this is a subscribers chat class, so uh, you have to be either a member or a subscriber of our channel. Um, join the more than 1.8 million uh, subscribers on our channel. Uh, so that you can join this type of lesson chat as well as get updates uh, for all of our new video releases, um, our live class schedules, our community posts, and just tons of help uh, for you to improve English communication, your IELTS band scores for an overall greater success in work school and life. Good to see you all. Um, in this class, everybody, we are looking at a listening section. We're looking at part three, which will be about zoos and turtles. That will be part uh, four for this listening section. Um, the uh, materials are coming from our websites, aehelp.com for academic IELTS and uh, gieltshelp.com for general IELTS. We've got tons of materials uh, there for you to get ready for your next test. Uh, we will be using our academic uh, IELTS uh, website today for the listening audio for those of you that have it. This is aehelp.com. You click this big red button here that's just right above my head uh, to join our premium package. You click that button, you get access to your interactive uh, uh, exams, uh, lesson videos, much, much more. You get app, uh, an app for your phone. Um, if you're doing general IELTS, it's gieltshelp.com. And again, uh, click that red button. I'm a British Council certified agent. Um, we are an official IELTS test registration center. We help thousands of IELTS students every day to succeed. Uh, use this discount code, um, HELP20. HELP20 uh, to get a 20% discount off the premium package. Absolutely worth it. You won't regret it. People that join our course, they're always like, yeah, that was just a Great investment, um, learned lots, okay. All right, Siam in Uganda, welcome. Hi, Deepti, uh, Mien, Vietnam, our member. Very nice to have you here. Amra, good to have you as well. Um, excellent, nice to see all of you in the class. That is great. Um, students, uh, get our apps, link them to the websites, Academic IELTS Help and General IELTS Help. Uh, general IELTS help links to gieltshelp.com and academic IELTS help links to aehelp.com. Um, Instagram IELTS underscore a help gieltshelp. help. Visit us there. If you have questions, um, just let me know. Uh, send me an email. Uh, my email is adrian at aehelp.com. Okay, we're here to help you succeed. Uh, we want you to pass IELTS, we want you to get a great band score. If you have questions, just send me an email and I will help you out. Um, all right, uh, live classes tomorrow as well. So tomorrow we will have task two writing uh, for members and we'll have a speaking part three for everyone. Uh, tomorrow's classes will be the same time as today's classes. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, um, you can always check out one of our awesome speaking videos with a candidate from Madhya Pradesh, India. I'll put this link into the uh, chat there. Um, that's one of our uh, latest and greatest uh, speaking videos with tips for your speaking section. And of course, um, free speaking classes on a light hall. You can register for that now. Uh, one will be June 19th. Again, I'm putting this into the chat, um, and this is for everyone. You don't have to be a member. You just simply go to Lighthall. Lighthall is a new platform 
for live teaching. Okay. Um, and uh, it works really well for uh, live speaking classes because you can talk to me, you can talk to other classmates, not just type, but you can actually talk on Life Hall. And it's real time, there's no lag, which is kind of cool. Okay, um, so listening tips. Um, we're doing, again, uh, listening. This is from our second exam book. Uh, we're starting with part three, so question 21 to question 30. Uh, the IELTS listening has four parts, as many of you know, and each part has 10 questions. And each um, uh, next part becomes more difficult. So uh, part one is the easiest, part two is uh, more difficult than part one, part three is even more, and then part four is technically supposed to be the most difficult part, okay? Um, each one being 10 uh, questions. Does anybody know how they increase the difficulty of the listening? So anybody know what IELTS actually does to make the listening more challenging for um, the next part? Because there is obviously the people that make the IELTS exams, they have strategies and um, techniques to uh, make um, the the next part of the listening more and more challenging. So Fateh says using synonyms. Uh, Simran says paraphrasing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, IELTS questions get more and more challenging as the listening uh, section progresses. Um, because there is uh, more paraphrasing. And it's not just um, synonyms. It's synonyms, antonym, negatives, uh, descriptives, uh, grammatical, okay, expressions, idioms. So they use more and more complicated forms of paraphrasing to see if people can still understand uh, what is going on, okay? All right. Um, so uh, pay attention to different forms and different types of paraphrasing, okay? It's not just synonyms. All right. Um, yeah, slow sunset by adding different kinds of accents, yep. So, um, multiple speakers, different accents. And you're actually going to hear that in this part three listening that we're doing because we will have a Canadian, British, and a New Zealand accent uh, in this part three that we're about to hear. So, yeah. Mr. Aziz John says, please do not be so fluent as I cannot understand. Um, well, Mr. Aziz John, I've got some interesting news from you. Uh, natural English. So, Um, IELTS is a proficiency exam. It's not an ESL exam. It's not an English as a second language exam. Um, so they do not uh, slow down. They do not um, speak differently, uh, thinking that you know somebody who doesn't speak English is taking the test. So that's why you know, uh, Mr. Aziz John, I try to 
be mindful um, of the audience and I do paraphrase a lot of what I say so that it's easier to understand. But at the same time, other than enunciating my words clearly, I attempt to follow a, a natural form of English that you could hear um, if you were here sitting uh, next to me in Canada talking to a teacher in high school or in college um, because that you will not be treated any different. So you have to be able to understand natural, smooth, fluent English to do well in the listening section. It's a proficiency exam. It's not an ESL exam. Okay, uh, keep that in mind. So if you're having difficulty understanding me, don't worry about it. Um, this video is recorded. You should go back, watch it again, listen again and practice until you reach the correct speed, okay? All right, um, one of the big dangers, by the way, and this is just a quick side note before we get into our listening, and I promise you that we will do listening, is be very careful, be very careful of IELTS classes where the teachers are talking to you or lecturing you as a as an ESL student because uh, you will be shocked when you get to the real exam and hear uh, fluent and natural English. Okay. I always worry when students are going to, you know, English classes and IELTS classes and the teacher is like, good morning, Sanjay. How are you today? I have been doing well. And then you get to the IELTS and it's suddenly like, well, uh, interestingly, zoos are among the most debatable places for the public to visit because, and you're just like, what? What did just happen? Um, so what was I learning in school, right? So uh, that happened to me, by the way. Uh, I learned Japanese in high school and university. And it was quite a surprise when I moved to Japan and I taught there for a year because in university even, you know, my teacher was like, Konnichiwa, o genki desu ka? Which basically means good day, how are you? And um, then I got to Japan and it was very different. Um, real Japanese is not the same. <laughs> so, um, so you have to listen to real natural English to prepare for your IELTS listening, okay? You must listen to real and natural. If we had some um, Japanese uh, students there, they were just probably like, what? <laughs> That's how they teach Japanese? Um, they're like, wakarahan, wakaranai. Um, okay, so you must listen to real natural English to get ready for IELTS. Uh, that's the only way to succeed, especially on part three and part four, which are faster, even more natural, even more complex. Okay, all right. Okay, um, so let's do this. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, this is our uh, questions for the listening. Um, so here we're going to listen, we're going to answer, and then I will talk more strategy after, okay? I want you to get into it and really just listen. Now, don't be shocked, this is part three. So we did part one and part two uh, last week. If you missed that, you can check out the video on the channel. Again, make sure to subscribe and hit the uh, notification, the bell button, so you can follow, okay? Um, so these are the questions. Uh, yeah, we can see those up there. That's great. All right. So I'm going to go to uh, our website um, to listen to the audio. And uh, this is a CD4 uh, track three for those of you that have access to our premium IELTS on our um, website. Okay. Track three because it's part three. That makes sense. So 
let me get into my student account here and then in my student account I want the audio CDs and in the audio CDs I want uh, CD uh, 4 fourth exam track three okay we're going to listen while we listen uh, answer the questions don't put the answers in the chat answer on a separate piece of paper it gives everybody a chance to provide their own um, answers and you don't confuse people with the wrong answer that way as well okay everybody here we go now um, uh, part three is about zoos so you should picture a zoo okay you're going to the zoo you paid some money to get in you see some animals elephants penguins um, lions tigers okay here we are Now turn to section 3. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section 3. You will hear a panel discussion on the ethics of zoos. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Welcome everyone to this very special evening. Tonight's speakers are two distinguished scholars. Dr Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh is a philosopher and animal rights advocate. Dr. Gloria Mesto from Trinity College Dublin is an animal conservationist. Welcome to you both. The topic of tonight's discussion is the ethics of zoos. Here is the fundamental question. Is it right to house animals in zoos or should they live freely in nature instead? As an animal rights advocate and theorist, I have clear views on this question. To me, it is fundamentally wrong to lock up animals for human enjoyment. I believe that in many important respects, animals are persons and should be afforded many of the rights that human beings have. Chief among these is the right to liberty and the freedom to achieve one's desired ends in life. Clearly these rights are abrogated by imprisonment within a zoo. Moreover, in many cases animals in zoos are treated inhumanely and are subject to confinement in extremely small spaces. While regulation of zoos may help mitigate some of these problems, I maintain that zoos are fundamentally unethical. I certainly understand Dr. Gergen's position, and I do agree on some of his points, most notably that zoos must be held to higher standards of animal treatment than they are currently. But my colleague fails to consider an important point in favor of zoos. The conservation of species is an incredibly important endeavor, and zoos are on the front line in the battle to save hundreds of species of animals around the world. Zoos often employ some of the leading experts in the field who are best equipped to carry out this important task. It is for this reason that I believe zoos are justified. Though they may not be perfect, I believe zoos and the experts they employ play a critical role in the conservation of species and therefore are ethically permissible. Dr. Gergen, do you have a rebuttal to that point? Yes, certainly. While I appreciated Dr. Mester's position as a conservationist, and I do appreciate the work she and others like her do for animal welfare around the world, I must disagree with her. While zoos certainly do play a role in animal conservation, it is not because they are zoos that they play this role. Dr. Gergen, can you clarify that point for the audience? Of course. What I mean is this. It is not inherent in the idea of a zoo that they conserve animals. The notions are separable. You can have an animal conservation effort that is not a zoo, just as you can have a zoo that has nothing to do with conservation. So while it is true that some zoos act as animal preserves, this does not justify the existence of zoos, since we could easily separate out these animal preserves from zoos themselves. Fair point, but such animal preserves would still have the associated problems of poor treatment and unsuitable living conditions. Yes but at least it would be in an effort towards a positive end. The animals would not be captive forever 
and they would not be captive merely for a human audience. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 27 to 30. What about the enjoyment and education that zoos provide, especially to young people? Perhaps individuals like yourselves were inspired to become animal advocates by attending a zoo when you were a child. That is a really interesting point. I was indeed inspired by going to a zoo when I was a child. What do you think, Dr. Gergen? It is an interesting thought. What if the positive outcomes caused by inspiring people like us to do good in the future outweigh the harms done to zoo animals? I'm not sure I would have to think about it more, but it's certainly an interesting question. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. In closing, I'm not sure how much progress we've made, but is it safe to say that we can all agree that zoos, at the very least, must do their best to improve the treatment of animals and the conditions in which the animals live? I would certainly agree with that, as I'm sure my friends would also agree. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, and then we use a half a minute to check our answers. And if you miss some questions, if you are kind of freaking out, like, well, that was like crazy hard, I'm not sure what was going on there. Don't panic, okay? Panicking is the worst uh, that you can uh, do. Instead, just stay calm, uh, use logic, think about zoos, think logically about zoos. And you can probably still get a lot of these. Um, a lot of these questions were multiple choice. So if you have good critical thinking, um, you can uh, figure these out. Now, um, of course, uh, one way that IELTS makes the questions uh, more difficult uh, for um, the uh, listening is the topics become more difficult. So here you have kind of a debate between uh, two people, two professors on the ethics of zoos, right? So. Um, the topics are more difficult, okay? Now, um, a very important tip for uh, part three and part four especially, okay? is you really have to catch the first part of what's going on because that sets a foundation or the context uh, for the rest of the uh, listening. It's important for part one and two as well, but it's even more important for part three and four so that you can understand what happens later. So um, tip for part three and part four especially, you must uh, understand the uh, first half minute of uh, the audio as it sets the context or foundation uh, for the uh, discussion or lecture. Okay, the example in this case is we had two professors Uh, Dr. Um, Gergen, something like that his name was spelled, um, who was an animal conservationist. And then um, we had um, uh, Dr. Uh, Mesto, Gloria Mesto, yeah. Uh, 
um, who is uh, in support of zoos. Okay. So a very, very important uh, piece to getting a good score on this part three was that you understood uh, at the very beginning that you have two people here, um, and then of course the host is the third person. Um, Dr. Gergen, the man, um, he is all about animals, okay? So saving animals, uh, allowing animals to live um, a full, rich, uh, healthy uh, life. And then there was a Gloria Mesto who um, believes that you know zoos are, are, are okay. And of course, Dr. Gergen who thinks zoos are not okay, right? So you've got the two sides of this uh, situation. And by understanding that, um, you put yourself into a position of getting most, if not all of these questions uh, answered correctly, okay? So does that make sense to everybody? And if you didn't catch that, then what you really need to do um, is you need to go to the uh, transcripts, which in this case in our book is on page 115, okay? And, um, and you have the actual script right here, okay? So it says, welcome everyone to this very special evening. Tonight's speakers are two distinguished scholars. Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh is a philosopher and animal rights advocate. Dr. Gloria Mesto from Trinity College Dublin is an animal uh, conservationist, okay? Uh, welcome to you both, okay? And then um, here, Dr. Uh, Henry Gergen starts talking about how uh, locking up animals is wrong. And then Dr. Mesto uh, talks about how um, zoos do a lot of important work. So you kind of get this picture of these two opposing views on zoos, okay? All right, um, so the first minute of the audio is very important. Make sure to focus on understanding that first minute okay all right um, I see that some people are asking for the answer keys we are going to go through the answers together and you can always get our answer keys by uh, getting all of our books and videos on um, our website okay all right um, but don't worry we'll look at the questions and the answers together now all right so um, here we go let's jump back all the way to the start of our book here uh, page one <laughs> from 114 back to page 12 okay uh, so having understood this let's answer some of these questions number one um, dr. Henry Gergen uh, where is dr. Henry Gergen from University of Edinburgh or Trinity College I just read the answer for you in the uh, transcript so it should be easy uh, Emra says it's A, Amra says it's A and B. Yeah, so this is question 21. So this is actually just one question in your booklet. And if you're doing the paper-based exam, um, then you would write your answer like this to get this one correct. Okay, you would write 1A comma 2B. Okay, so in the space provided, that's how you would do it. If you're doing the computer-based exam, you would just drag and drop these most likely, or you would just type in uh, A and then uh, B. Okay, so a little bit different format uh, depending on computer-based or not. Um, I do recommend using capital letters, so big A, okay, big B, they're easier to read. Uh, when you're transferring your answers in the answer booklet, make sure to use those. So big A, big B. Okay, now uh, let's get to question 22 to 24. Okay, Mi Yen, good job. A lot of you got that. Ni Tu, got it correct as well. Good. Uh, here we had this multi, multiple choice question, okay, where uh, it's question 22 to 24. So here you can put the correct answers in any order. Each one counts for one point, all right? The question was, which three of the following are arguments given against zoos? 
a very important word here, and this is where sometimes candidates makes, make mistakes, is the argument is against zoos. Against zoos means uh, why zoos should not exist. So what is bad about zoos? Now, notice how um, what I did for this question is I took notes. Did everybody see that? So while this question was happening, um, what I did is I took some notes because this is too much. All these answers, A, B, C, D, E, F, it's too much information for me to try to process, understand, digest while the audio is going. So it's not effective for me to try to read through that and pick out what I hear. It's very difficult, even as a native English speaker, that's really challenging to do. So instead of doing that, what I'm doing is I'm simply just taking notes like these notes here. And then once I have these notes, then from these notes, I can figure out uh, which one of these matches. OK, so like I had the note here, um, it's wrong to lock up animals, right? So. Animals are treated inhumanely. Nope. Animals are persons. No conservations. Animals should not be in prison. Okay. Um, so um, that kind of seems like an okay answer. I'll keep that in mind. So maybe. Okay. Um, animals are persons. That one matches directly. I can see that right there. So B is one of my answers for sure. Uh, rights to freedom. Animals should not be in prison. Maybe. Okay. Animals are treated inhumanely. Okay. Uh, that's A. Okay. We're verbatim. Okay. So A definitely seems like the right answer as well. Zoos are unethical. Zoos are fundamentally wrong. Okay, that is pretty close to the same. So F looks okay. All right, um, so um, right to freedom and um, animals wrong to lock up. Um, is D a correct answer? So F looks good. B and A definitely look good. D kind of looks good to me, but there's something wrong with D. Um, what is D? Why is it? Why is it D? Uh, Hijabi says, I didn't get how B is an answer. Uh, the pers the um, the speaker says animals are persons. They're like humans. Uh, they deserve, they have emotions, they have thoughts. You know, an elephant thinks, becomes sad, becomes angry. It's like a human, right? Ah, so Tan, new win, very smart. Tan says that the reason why D is wrong is because prison is not a zoo. Okay, so careful with bad paraphrasing. Okay. So uh, this is not correct because prison uh, is not equal to zoo. The animals might disagree, um, but uh, in zoos, animals are in cages, but they are not treated as prisoners, i.e. <clears throat> they are given good food. Okay. So um, careful with bad paraphrasing. Now, if you're like, yeah, sure, Adrian, that's fine. But if in the real IELTS exam, that would be really hard for me to uh, figure out or to see, uh, then don't worry about it. Um, so mark uh, all of these as possible answers. So A, B, D, and F. And then in the 
time that you have to check your answers, this is what you want to check. So in that 30 seconds, this is where you want to think, okay, which one of these was the least accurate from these four? And then you realize that um, animals are not really in prison. Prison is a different word. It's a different idea, okay? So um, here, uh, the answer is uh, A, B, and F. Okay. Now again, the animals might disagree. They might say it's prison, but humans don't consider zoos technically to be prisons. Even the cages are a little bit different, right? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, let's look at uh, questions 25 to 27. So we've got three questions here. Uh, short answer. Uh, let's do this. So write no more than two words and or a number. Always pay attention uh, to those instructions, okay? Uh, in order to improve the conditions for zoo animals, zoos must be held to something of animal treatment, okay? Emra says, yeah, Siraj, B-A-F are the correct answers for the previous one. Yeah, absolutely, okay? Um, Emra and Umra <laughs> both say that the correct answer for this is higher standards. Okay, and this is just a small H here. Higher standards is correct. Okay, um, they repeated that concept maybe four times or five times um, in the audio. So pay attention to uh, repeating concepts as these are going to be answers, okay? So higher standards, they, they talk about it multiple times. So like they should be higher standards. It's important to have higher standards in zoos. And we see that answer come back again later. You're, you're going to notice that, okay? So the correct answer is higher standards. And it looks like a lot of you got that. So a lot of you were like, yeah, we, I picked that up. They kept repeating um, that uh, question, okay? Or sorry, not that question, that, uh, that statement, that uh, collocation. All right, um, this one was a bit tricky because the answer you really had to wait for it, really pay attention to who is speaking. So here, we had to make sure that we were listening to the man, to Dr. Gergen speaking. Uh, number 26, while zoos do conserve animal life, Dr. Gergen argues that this function could also be performed by animal something. So here we need a noun which is the object of the sentence. Okay, so performed, we have to pay attention to this verb. Uh, performed by means done by. So done by what? Uh, Amra says animal exports. Uh, Sudarashan says welfare. They basically talk about two types of places for animals. One was uh, zoos. Um, what was the animal? What was, what was the other one? <laughs> what was the animal? Uh, what was the other one? I was thinking of the answer. Um, what was the other one? So zoos on one side and on the other side it was, and you have to know the English here. If you don't know the English, it is kind of challenging. Mandeep says conversationists. I think you have a spelling mistake there, Mandeep. Okay, if you're not sure, any point you're not sure, uh, you go to the um, transcripts. Okay. And we have the transcripts here. Um, okay, so 
here, uh, Dr. Ger uh, Dr. Gergen clarifies this point. And says, of course, what I mean is this, it is not inherent in the idea of a zoo that they conserve animals, meaning save animals. The notions are separable. You can separate them. You can have an animal conservation effort that is not a zoo, just as you can have a zoo that has nothing to do with conservation. So while it is true that some zoos act as animal preserves, this does not justify the existence of zoos since we could easily separate out these animal preserves from zoos themselves. In some parts of the world, such as Africa, for example, has uh, massive um, animal preserves. Uh, so the correct answer is coming from here, animal preserves. Now, uh, for some of you, that might be New English. Um, an animal preserve is like a national park, for instance, where animals cannot be captured, cannot be hunted. They are protected by law and by special conservation officers. They're kind of like special police. I know that India, for example, has um, some uh, very important animal preserves that protect uh, the habitats of uh, Bengal tigers, right? So um, the correct word here is animal preserves, all right? And again, that might be New English. So yeah, I mean, some parts of listening are going to be challenging and you have to, you know, know the English behind um, the information. So here, uh, let's jump back to Whenever, by the way, you see new language and you're learning new language, make sure to um, make sure to write it down so you learn it. Okay, animal preserves. Uh, the word preserve is a very important word. If you don't know it, look it up in the dictionary, and you'll see lots of different important definitions for it. So um, here, you have the word animal, so don't write animal. You just need one word here: preserves. Okay by animal preserves, and you need the plural here. This question, you know, arguably it's testing for who is a band eight, band nine uh, level uh, student, okay? This one was a little bit easier. The speaker really enunciated this and they talked about it. Number 27, enjoyment and something are two key positive attributes of zoos. Uh, the second word here, and I can see that Simran and Mandeep um, have the correct answers is education okay uh, just think about it when you go to a zoo you learn about the animals right Ooh, I've never seen that kind of bird before amazing right you learn about it so enjoyment and education are uh, two key positive aspects so the answer there was education okay 25, higher standards, 26, preserves, 27, education. Now for the multiple choice. Okay, the big tip, the big trick for multiple choice is listen for the answer. The very common mistake that many IELTS candidates make with multiple choice is they stare at the choices, like they stare, like really stare. And they think that suddenly when the answer comes, one of those choices is going to go bam and like be like, oh, that's, that's the one. Um, it only works for a couple of the questions. For most of the multiple choice questions, that doesn't work. And it leads to wrong answers because while a person's doing that, they miss the correct answer, okay? Because they're paraphrasing. So they're using different words and they're using cumulative information for the answer. So you can't just be staring at the answer. Um, in this case, the man does say it very clearly. So the correct answer was he's unsure. 
and he does actually say I'm not sure he actually doesn't say I'm uh, I'm unsure he says I'm not sure uh, I will have to think about it okay um, but the reason I know that is because I was listening for the answer and not staring at C going oh there it is um, I, instead I was listening for the answer and when he said oh I, I'm not sure I'll have to think about that then I was like okay he's unsure so I put two and two together right I'm not sure I'll have to think about it okay C is he is unsure let's put those two together they are the same he's paraphrasing simple paraphrasing but that's what's happening there okay so the most important um, a tip for multiple choices pay attention to the question and listen for the answer um, once you feel you heard the answer find the closest match okay all right everybody got that focus students Focus, focus in the chat. I see some chatter. It's all about focus. Uh, in the real IELTS, you're going to be sitting for three hours in the exam. Uh, so far, you've only been sitting for 46 minutes with me. So if you are losing focus right now, uh, that could be a problem. <laughs> okay? uh, because in the real exam, you're going to be uh, in the test for uh, almost four times this amount okay so four times so you have to be able to focus maintaining focus is an important part of success all right um, interesting question we've got these uh, quotation marks here everyone so quotation mark quotation mark and I promise you the real IELTS may maybe even less interesting than these live classes so if you're starting to think about who's from Nepal, who's from Canada, who's from another part of the world, and you're not able to focus on my voice, aye, aye, aye. could be trouble in the real exam. 46 minutes. Your listening section isn't even over yet. <laughs> you haven't even started the reading. Oh, no. What are you going to be thinking about when you get to the reading question? Who's making strawberry pie for your birthday? Although it's important certainly not as important as learning to focus on what you're doing um, interesting question quotation direct quote okay uh, when you see a direct quote that's an easy answer so direct speech um, or direct quote it's also called uh, should be easy because the speaker will say exactly what you see okay so what is the interesting question again I want to answer on my own uh, whether or not education uh, of zoos is more important than um, locking up animals people learn about animals if people understand animals they might be inspired to help animals they might be a little bit more careful when they're visiting a park um, or when they're driving and they see an animal so uh, the education aspect of uh, zoos is very valuable and um, the um, the speaker says that they say oh I'm not sure which one okay so um, a whether zoos are ethical whether the inspiration value of zoos outweighs their negative aspects whether enjoyment and inspiration negate the importance of zoos uh, clearly the correct answer here is B because B matches with what I just said okay the other two don't the other two are clearly wrong okay so what do the guests agree on and they all agree on this even I think even the host they're like can we all agree that this is okay um, and this is going back to higher standards that previous collocation that we talked about um, for question 26 um, what do they agree on that zoos can always be better right um, we should always 
do our best to make zoos as comfortable as possible for the animals that live there. So uh, the best answer here is A, right? Again, thinking about my own answer first and then answering. So zoo conditions need to be improved. Now you just use the letter. So just A goes into your answer sheet. Uh, in the computer-based exam, it's a bit easier because the instructions for the questions are really easy to follow. Okay, so uh, correct answers, just a quick recap here so you can um, see how you did. Uh, question 21, it was number 1A, number 2B. Question 22 to 24 was A, B, and F. Question 25, higher standards. Uh, question 26, preserves. Uh, question 27, education. Uh, question 28, C. Question 29, B. Question 30, A. Let's do part four. So get your listening brains going, your ears focused. And uh, again, avoid putting answers into the chat because if you share wrong answers, it gets really confusing for others. Uh, let's jump back to our um, website for the audio and uh, turtles, turtles everyone. Here we go. Uh, listen carefully, answer the questions, and at the end, we'll see how you did. Here we go, CD4, track four on the website. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a professor discussing the migration of loggerhead turtles. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. It's late April on the South Atlantic coast of North America, and one of the most remarkable journeys in all of nature is about to begin. The loggerhead turtle, whose natural habitat is the open ocean, has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of Florida provide a perfect nesting spot, with soft sand that can be dug up by the persistent flippers of the female loggerhead. Over the course of the next three months, hundreds of thousands of eggs will be laid on such beaches. Many of these eggs will become the victim of predators, but many will survive to hatching, which occurs two months after being laid. Hatching marks the beginning of an incredible journey for the loggerhead turtle. Almost immediately upon hatching, the young turtles, known as hatchlings at this point, head for the open ocean. The ocean, while full of its own dangers and predators, provides a relative safe haven for the hatchlings away from many of the predators that live near the shoreline. These young turtles embark upon a journey that will take them upwards of 13,000 kilometers around the North Atlantic. Many animals make large and incredible journeys, but what makes the loggerhead turtle's migration so notable is the speed at which the animal moves. While many bird species make similar journeys, they move at velocities much faster than the loggerhead turtle. This slow-moving beast travels at the remarkably sluggish pace of only three quarters of a kilometer per hour. This means it will take the turtle a minimum of 17,000 hours to complete its migratory journey not even taking into account stops for feeding and sleep. To put that number in perspective, 17,000 hours is approximately two years of non-stop swimming. That the loggerhead turtle makes this journey alone makes it all the more impressive. From birth to adolescence to adulthood, the loggerhead turtle is a solitary traveler. But how does it know where to go? Doesn't it need a parent to help it know the route? This is where the loggerhead becomes even more fascinating. Recent research tells us the loggerhead uses the magnetic field of the Earth to determine its migration route. 
Because the Earth's magnetic field differs in each location around the world, the loggerhead turtle can use it as a kind of innate roadmap, illuminating the way to where they need to be. One example of this is the behaviour they exhibit when they encounter the particular magnetic field off the coast of Portugal. Instead of continuing north, towards the cold waters of northern Europe, they sense the magnetic field and turn around, instead heading for the warmer waters of northwestern Africa. And it is not just that the loggerhead turtle has a sort of innate compass. They are able to determine, with surprising precision, their latitude and longitude. They know exactly when to zig and zag to optimise their migratory pattern. Even with their incredible ability to know where they are and where they need to be, the survival rate of migratory loggerhead turtles is incredibly low. In fact, only about 1 in 4,000 hatchlings makes it back to the beach in eastern Florida to mate and lay its eggs. However, that any make it at all is an incredible achievement and one of the great natural wonders of navigation. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. And check those answers, students. I'm going to stop the audio. So use that half minute always to check your answers. Um, so often when I'm training um, students, I notice that uh, you know they're able to pick up at least one or two extra points when they use that half uh, minute. And sometimes the difference between uh, band 6.57 is one question, two questions, okay? So use that. All right, uh, let's go through these. So notice how I use some key words to position myself in the flow. Part four is challenging because it's a very quick flow of specific information. And there are key words like verbs, for example, uh, like um, uh, lay eggs, okay? Uh, sandy beach, nice collocation there. Uh, ocean, uh, ocean here. Um, so there are some key words that let you position yourself in the information in the audio and that helps you to provide the right answers. Now it's fast so you really have to focus on um, going with the audio. Okay. All right, let's do this. So the loggerhead turtle has to seek dry land to lay its eggs the sandy beaches of something now i know this is a place provide the perfect location for nesting um so uh what is the correct answer here for 31 where do they go uh emra says it's florida it is florida uh, making sure of course that the f is capital because it's the name of a state and this has to be a capital. If it's a small f, you will get it wrong. Okay, capital letters are very important. You can use all capitals in the listening. It's just slower if you're doing the paper-based test, so careful. Mithu says Brazil. Um, they might make, I don't know if they make it as far as, as south as Brazil. I'm not sure, I'm not an expert in the loggerhead turtle, but definitely Florida. There's a lot of loggerhead turtles that make it back to Florida, okay? All right, um, after hatching, the loggerhead turtle immediately, this is, uh, this is not just any turtle, okay? Make sure you're paying attention. This is the loggerhead turtle. So after hatching, the loggerhead turtle immediately heads for the ocean. And here I was listening for this word ocean because she was, you know, the professor was talking, 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 but she wasn't talking about the ocean. And then eventually she's like, and the ocean, the ocean is, she doesn't use the same words. She uses different words, but she says this information. Uh, she says the ocean has fewer something. And again, it's a noun. Um, often these answers are nouns. So it has fewer what? Less what? Um, how can it be safer? Kiran and Amr say it's fewer predators. Yeah, predators are basically hunters, so animals that hunt other animals, humans being amongst the greatest uh, predators, of course, on the planet. 
So less predators, less danger of being eaten. Um, I actually watched the show on um, turtles. I don't think they were loggerheads. They were a different kind of turtle, but they do kind of similar or have similar behaviors. And, you know, I was like, the ocean? Less predators? Like there's sharks and fish and all kinds of other predators. But then when I saw the birds attacking these poor little baby turtles, I was like, yeah, you got to get to the ocean. Like they're just like little tiny turtles and they're, going so slow on the sand and then you see these birds that are just dive bombing um these poor little turtles and they don't have a chance it's, it's absolutely horrific i feel so bad for them um yeah birds Ooh. uh all right um so the turtles embark on a journey that will take them something kilometers now this should probably be a number it's going to be a big number <laughs> because it's around the Atlantic. So if you put like um, 17, it's probably not right. Okay. Um, if you put 150 or 1150, probably not right. Okay. Around the Atlantic. The Atlantic is huge. So it's got to be a big number. Okay. And a lot of people are saying 13,000. Um, I did not write that down, but uh, that is the correct answer, yeah. So 13,000 kilometers. Yeah, the Atlantic is quite big. So 13,000. The easiest is just to write the number, 13,000, okay? Uh, don't write km or kilometers because it's given, okay? So all you need here is just this big whopping number, uh, 13,000 kilometers around the Atlantic. Okay. Um, while long migratory journeys are fairly commonplace in nature, what makes the loggerheads journey especially notable is the extreme what pace that it travels at. And then they were saying this, I remember they even said three quarters of a kilometer per hour, which if you think about it, swimming wise, it's pretty fast. I, I couldn't swim that fast on average for that long, that's for sure. Um, sluggish, yeah, very nice. Lots of people got that. Sluggish means slow, like a slug. I bet somebody's going to put a slug emoji into the chat. Uh, slug is another type of animal. It's a snail without a house. Um, I don't, do we have a slug emoji? I'm sure we have a snail emoji, um, but I, I don't think we have a slug emoji. Poor slugs. People love snails, but they don't like slugs, which is so strange. They like it when the slug has a house, but then they think it's kind of gross when they don't have a house, which is kind of weird. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm still looking for that snail emoji. Where's the snail emoji? Um, all right, so sluggish. Sluggish here is actually an adjective. It means slow. <laughs> There's Carolina. Carolina found us the snail emoji. Thank you, Carolina. My day is now complete. And now that I have it. Okay, all right. So uh, sluggish pace. Sluggish pace means slow speed. So when you uh, learn new English, write it down, use it. Sluggish pace. I was going to work today. I had a really sluggish pace because I didn't have coffee and I didn't have good sleep. So I was sluggish all the way to the office. Okay. All right. Um, the entire journey is equal to approximately something of continuous swimming with no breaks. <laughs> I do long distance running, but I'm jealous. I can't uh, compete with these turtles. These turtles are swimming, 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 swimming. And Simran says they're swimming for two years. I'm pretty proud of myself when I swim for an hour. I don't know about you. But if I do one hour of continuous swimming, I'm like, ah, yeah. Atta boy, Adrian. Ah, oh, you're a fit, healthy guy. The turtle would probably look at me and laugh and be like, nyak, 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 nyak. one hour? Seriously? Two years. Um, 17,000 kilometers. Top that. Okay, I'd be like, I don't have flippers, I have hands. Um, so yeah, okay. Yeah, swimming is very exhausting, Emmer says, uh, especially if you're doing it for two years. Okay, use numbers whenever possible. Okay. 
All right, um, so that was the end of that flow chart. If you missed some questions in the flow chart listening, don't worry, you might be able to answer them later once you complete the listening. So never, ever, ever panic uh, when you miss a question in the listening, okay? So just keep going, okay? All right, um, here we go. So write no more than two words and or a number for each answer. Um, as incredible as the loggerhead turtle's journey is, what makes it even more impressive is that the loggerhead is a something traveler. So uh, again, it's a, an adjective here. Uh, Simran, very nice. Uh, Simran says uh, the turtle is a solitary coming from the word solo. Um, anybody play that uh, card game on the computer called Solitaire? <laughs> you're gonna have like this amazing moment where you're like, you just blew my mind. Um, one of the really popular games that comes pre-installed on computers for Windows since like the early 90s or maybe even the 80s is a card game called Solitaire. And uh, Vanky says yes, Carolina says yes. Right, okay, um, that card game is called Solitaire because you play it alone. You know, card games, usually you play with other people like poker or canasta or rummy or whatever you're doing out there. And most card games are played with at least two or more people, except some, like Solitaire. Um, and Solitaire is because it's a solitary card game. So now you're probably like, Boom after all this time playing that card game. I actually know why they call it that. Okay, I hopefully made your weekend just like Carolina made mine with the, uh, with the snail emoji. Okay, so remember, solitaire. I think it's like that, solitaire. I don't even know how they spell the game name, solitaire. It's coming from French, this word, by the way, French roots, a lot of, uh, And French cards, right? So those are French cards. So it's no surprise that the name of the game is coming from French into English as well. And we use it as an adjective, solitary. So solitary means to do it alone. Okay, cool. Everybody got that. And maybe I killed that a little bit. Um, so solitary traveler, traversing. Traversing means crossing the open ocean on its own for years at a time. Uh, scientific research has in recent years told us that it is through a connection with the Earth's something. Do, 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 do. Um, Semran, Shudarashan, Venke, Tanyuin, uh, Amra, Nitu all say that 37 should be magnetic field. It is. Like, I think birds also do this. Uh, the magnetic field. Navigation. I wish I could sense the magnetic field of the Earth. Maybe I can, but not enough, not like the turtles. I wish I could sense it like the turtles. Then I wouldn't need GPS in my car. I could just use my brain. Um, so magnetic field that the turtles find their way around the ocean. For example, the turtles are able to sense something off the coast of what? It's a country here. And uh, yeah, I, I could always sense something around here too. No, I'm just kidding. I couldn't sense anything. Um, the country of Portugal. Yeah, very good. Again, countries, states, cities, big capital letter for the per first letter, Portugal. Okay, makes them change their direction and head for Northwest Africa. Here I listened to the word Africa. It helped me to position where I am in the audio. And then possessing more than a simple compass. So not just a compass. It's not like a north, west, south, east. Um, the loggerhead can innately sense it's something. So planet Earth, we have kind of like a grid on planet Earth. Okay, so here is planet Earth. And we have these arbitrary lines that um, go... Uh, around it and we have this very famous one that's kind of this middle line here here let me use a different color for that 
Um, we have a very famous one that everybody should know. And then we have these other kind of famous ones that go a little bit north and a little bit south of that one. Okay. All right. Um, so the loggerhead can innately sense it's... Emra, I thought about comedy. Yeah. Maybe something I'll do as a hobby later. Um, Shudder Rashan says latitude and longitude. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Venki says that middle line is the uh, not equator, it's equator. Yes, equ equator. Yeah, correct. Yeah, got it. Okay, um, so uh, 39, latitude. Okay. Uh, so latitude, very important, people, very important English. Okay, this could save your life if you ever get lost um, and they're asking for your position or they're telling you your position. Uh, you never know, right? Especially for those of you who like boats. Um, so here, uh, latitude, they are these lines that go uh, horizontally. Okay, and longitude are these lines that go vertically. Okay, let me go that direction. There are those lines, okay? So um, this is your uh, latitude and this is your uh, longitude. And of course, if you know the two, then you can position yourself um, on the planet, okay? All right. And uh, Tropic of Cancer, I believe, is the south of the equator and Tropic of Capricorn is north of the equator, but somebody might correct me on that. Um, so I believe Tropic of Cancer is to the south, Tropic of Capricorn um, is north. Somebody's asking, what's the word innately mean? Amra, innate means you are born with it. Okay, so let me, yeah, if you have a word that you're not sure of, just ask me, okay? So the word innately, um, is it coming from the word innate? Okay, innate means to be born with the ability. Okay, so all humans are born, um, all humans can uh, breathe innately. Okay. So you don't have to learn to breathe. You're just born with that ability, okay? All right, um, approximately, number 40, approximately what percentage of hatchlings uh, make it back to the breeding ground in Florida? This was so sad. Um, again, it's those birds. Birds probably do most of the damage right away. Um, so how many of these little turtles make it back? They don't say the percentage. Um, a lot of you are saying A, which is great. You figured that out. Um, it's uh, one in 4,000, which is equal to, if you do the math, 0 0.00, sorry, 0 0.025 percent, okay? Um, because you should know that one in 100 equals uh, 1 percent, right? Uh, one in a thousand uh, equals uh, 0.1% or to make it clear 0.1% and one in 4,000 logically of course uh, would equal uh, 0 0.025 now, some of you are probably like, Adrian, oh, come on, math, really? I thought Alex is English. No, you have to do some simple math and don't panic. I mean, um, you don't have to be like, okay, I, but how do I know one in 4,000 like that? I'm stressed out. I'm sitting in the Alex exam. Well, you know that one in 4,000 cannot be B or C, right? So one in 4,000 is definitely not 2.5% and certainly not 25%. So you can figure out by deduction that it's got to be that one, okay? Even if you couldn't do the math. So 2.5% um, would be at least um, five of these little guys out of a couple hundred. 25% uh, would be one in four, right? So, and that math I'm sure you can do. 
So keep that in mind. Okay, everyone, uh, question, especially if you were here in last week's class also. Uh, how did you do? Um, what did you get from uh, 40? What was your score, your overall? This is called your raw score. And then your raw score is uh, converted, it's changed into your band score. Ben, uh, score. Okay, Amra says 35 out of 40. I'll show you where you can check that, by the way. Amra, you probably know this is coming. Um, if you go to our website, uh, at the very, very bottom, let's make this ginormous. Okay, um, let's see if you can see this. At the very, very bottom here, you have this uh, score calculator. Okay, uh, can you see that there? I don't think you can. Yeah, it's too too far down and I can't move it up, so it's fine. But at the very bottom, if you keep going down, like down there, you'll see these options and you'll see a score calculator and you can click on that and then up pops this score calculator where you can type 35 into um, the answer, or the, uh, or sorry, that was 25, which was a six, uh, but you can do 35 And then you kind of get this eight. Can you see the eight there when I did that? Or is it just off screen? Let me uh, make this smaller again. Yeah, there, you'll probably see it now. So uh, when you use that score calculator, then you can convert your scores uh, into your uh, score there, just above my head, you can see it now. So 35 is an eight. Uh, Akira says 27. Let's do Akira. 25 was a six, I think, and 27 is a 6.5. So that's your difference of two points, okay? Okay, all right. Um, good, good. Uh, Sudarashan said 34 for these. Uh, 34 is a 7.5, okay? All right, um, so if you like this class, if you want all of our practice exams, we've got six full practice exams on the website. We've got lots of videos. Uh, we got apps for your phone. Um, doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, join our uh, premium miles package. Click any of those red buttons that come up on the page and then you are good to go. So you click that and you should be able to use this code here, HELP20. Help 20, somebody was asking me what's a discount code. So help 20, uh, continue, and you get a 20% discount with that code, okay? Uh, students, uh, that was awesome. Um, keep listening, keep working hard, visualize, picture what you hear. Um, I will be back uh, tomorrow with more live classes on Saturday for you. Um, those will be task two writing for members and speaking part three for everyone. Uh, again, make sure to join us at aehelp.com and gieltshelp.com. aehelp.com for academic IELTS and gieltshelp.com for general IELTS. Uh, use that code, HELP20, for that 20% discount on the websites. I'm Adrian. I'm signing out from beautiful Western Canada, the province of British Columbia here on Vancouver Island, the southern tip of Vancouver Island, Victoria, beautiful city. Uh, on the Pacific Ocean. And uh, I will be back again tomorrow. Much love to all of you. Have a great start to your weekend. Bye for now.